Good afternoon. Okay. Come on, good home training. Good afternoon. Right. My name is Sophia Elijah, and I'm the Executive Director of the Correctional Association of New York. And it is indeed my pleasure to welcome you to the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. And the Sackler Center is joining with the Correctional Association for today's, well, for this three-day series called States of Denial. States of Denial is actually going to go on for several weeks, but the Correctional Association partnered with the Sackler Center for the first three. Some of you may have caught our program yesterday that focused on Attica, and today we're going to focus on issues involving young people and, shall we say, more mature people. We don't say older, right? More mature. The gray-haired people in the room, you know what we're talking about. And the plight of those people who are incarcerated. I'm going to ask you if you have your cell phones. I know everybody's got some mobile device. Please turn it to vibrate or off so we don't interrupt in that way. And on behalf of Elizabeth Sackler, who couldn't be with us today, um, I want to express to you how very, very pleased both the Sackler Center and the Correctional Association are to be doing this, these events together and the fact that you're joining with us to learn something very important about what's going on in our prison system here in New York State. I'll just share a little bit about the Correctional Association. For those of you who don't know, we are celebrating our 170th birthday this year. Back in 1844, some very wealthy people got together and expressed their concern about what was happening in the prisons in New York State, the conditions under which people were being held and the world in which they were returning to. And together they formed the Correctional Association and two years later, the New York State Legislature passed a statute giving us a mandate or the unfettered access to the prisons throughout the state, giving us the right to monitor what was going on in the prisons and to report out our findings to the public and to our elected officials. We have been doing that good work since 1846, and it's no small notion for a not-for-profit organization to sustain itself for 170 years, so I'm really, really full of ourselves. Okay. <laughs> Today's program, as I said, is going to focus on the plight of young people and older people, more mature people, in the prison system in New York State. And the panel will be moderated by our own Tanisha Ingram, who does a whole lot of things. But she, amongst those things, at the Correctional Association, she heads our Safe Passages program, which is a program for system-involved youth, primarily LGBTQ youth and youth who are um, supporters of them to become advocates and leaders in their own right to push for change to improve the conditions for young people inside the prisons and um, focus on what's happening in the criminal justice system at large for young people. As I said, that Tanisha is the, the head of the Safe Passages program. She, her official title is the Youth and Community Coordinator of our Juvenile Justice Project. And she's been in that title since September of 2011. Tanisha oversees our Safe Passages Youth Leadership Program, which engages youth in advocacy around the issues in the juvenile justice system. Prior to joining us, Tanisha spent many years mentoring and helping transform the lives of young people through her work with the international organization Youth at Risk, and also managed various mentoring programs throughout New York City for young people whose parents are incarcerated and for children in single parent households and teenage parents. We at the Correctional Association are absolutely blessed and thrilled to have Tanisha with us. And at this point, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Tanisha so you can be thrilled to have her running the show for the rest of the afternoon. Join me in welcoming her. Good afternoon, everyone. You guys are looking, you guys are looking good. 
So as Sophia said, I'm Tanisha Ingram. I'm the Youth and Community Coordinator at the Juvenile Justice Project. And we're excited and thrilled about this conversation that we're about to have. This is a community conversation. This is a community issue. We're looking forward to talking more about the work that we're doing on our campaigns and also hearing from you guys at the end, towards the end of our session. So are you guys ready? Because I'm ready. So, <laughs> so we're going to start off the conversation, which is called What's Age Got to Do With It? I'm going to bring to the stage two people that I am blessed to be able to work with. Um, as I mentioned before, the Correctional Association has two important campaigns that we're working on. It's one to raise the age of criminal responsibility in New York, and one to release aging people from prison. Um, so the two people that will join me right now, the first person is Gabrielle Harris Prisco. She is the director of the Juvenile Justice Project at the Correctional Association. She um, works on local, state, and national youth justice issues. Gabrielle coordinates the CA's Juvenile Justice Coalition and was recently appointed by New York State's governor to be the advisory council of the Justice Center for Protection of People with Special Needs and is a member of the New York State Strategic Plan and Action Committee. She previously worked as a legal aid attorney for children and family court and as the project manager at, of Legal Aid's Data Collection and Policy Project. So she did a lot. Joining Gabrielle would be Mohammed, Mohammed Mahajid Farid. He is the lead organizer of the Release Aging People from Prisoner campaign. He spent many of his formative years in youth and adult penal institutions in New York State. During his last incursion into state prison, he served 33 years before he was released in 2011. While serving time, Farid earned four college degrees. Since his release in 2011, Farid has initiated two programs designed to have a substantial impact on providing relief for those confined in New York State prisons, as well as for those being released. The RAP campaign and the Rise and, Science, Rise and Shine Business Coalition Fareed has also received the Soros Justice Fellowship for organizing and leading the RAP campaign, along with the joint New York State Legislative Recommendation for doing so. So please join me in welcoming Fareed and Gabrielle. Great. Let's clap it up for these great people again. We didn't even say anything yet. <laughs> <laughs> so we're here today to talk about what's age got to do with it. That's the theme of today. So before we get started, um, from your perspectives, what is the it that we're referring to and what's age got to do with it? What might that it be? Well, first of all, thank you all for being here and thank you, Tanisha. I think the it is the criminal justice system in America and to take a little bit of a deeper dive into that, I would say there's sort of three it's we're really looking at. And one is how our current policies and practices both increase crime so they don't help public safety. And in addition to that, they really dehumanize and terrorize you know, large sections of our population. So that's the first it, is how our current policies and practices fail both people and communities. The second it is how we police people and prosecute crime. Who gets policed? Who gets prosecuted? What are the impacts and who are they born by? And the third it is mass incarceration as a response to crime. So what is the phenomena of mass incarceration in this country? How does it play out for children and for our elders? Thank you. What do you say that it is, Fareed? Um, again, I want to uh, thank everyone for being here. Uh, greetings. Uh, I think that's a very important question that it, because it sets the framework for everything that we should be talking about here today. Uh, without defining the it, uh, we, can't we can't even answer the question about age, whether or not age is something that uh, determines this it. In addition, uh, if we talking about some social ills or maladies, how we define the it uh, is, is going to determine whether or not we get to the heart of the matter mm -hmm. or whether we skirt the issues. And so uh, 
it seems to me that based on our labeling, uh, it's easy to think that the, it is mass incarceration or incarceration in general. Uh, but I'd ask the question that are we saying that if we reduce the number of people in prison or the amount of time people serve in prison, if we can somehow be successful at that, uh, is everything going to be fine and dandy after that? Uh, does that solve our major social ills like welfare, substandard housing, the digital divide, and a whole host of other things that I think are closely in, uh, associated with incarceration and mass incarceration? And so I take issue with the uh, conclusion that the, it is incarceration or mass incarceration. I think that it's something deeper, uh, much deeper, uh, a social problem that uh, we don't need to be skirting. And I would like to uh, quote what W.E.B. Du Bois said quite a while back, that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line race, and I think that's still the issue here in the 21st century, the whole issue of race. I know some people don't like to go there, that there's even some progressives that consider taking that approach divisive, uh, but I think it's important that we face these factors of truth. Uh, and to try to illustrate and prove my point, I would just like to ask everybody to engage in this imaginary scenario with me for a moment. And I would, like, I would ask everybody to try to imagine a scenario where there's a rural community far from the inner city and in this rural community, the people that populate this community is 99.9% .9 black, Hispanic, and people of color. And then imagine that the economy of this rural community is based on prisons, that because of uh, modern day economics and how we have advanced with uh, uh, businesses leaving the United States to do their uh, operations overseas. Imagine that the economy of this black rural community is dependent on prisons being there. And then go on and imagine that the population of this prison system in this rural community is majority white. And then, if you can go any further, I want you to try to imagine that there comes a time when uh, the crime rate drops so low that policymakers begin talking about closing prisons. And then imagine that the black people and their representatives in this rural community rise up and resist the closing of prisons. And because they can't rely on scare tactics such as crime, that they, they come right out and admit that it's all about jobs. And then imagine that they meet a measure of success in that. That if not able to stop the closing of these prisons in their track, they are able to slow it down considerably because of jobs consideration. Fareed, now, Fareed yeah. thank you for your yeah. very thoughtful um, response. Yeah. I actually want to, because something else is coming up for me. So you're mentioning rising up and I know that the releasing agent of people from prison is a campaign. Right. So I think this will be a great opportunity for you to share what are the goals of your campaign. 
I'd like to just take 30 seconds and conclude. Okay. And bring everybody down from this 30. imaginary situation. Okay, I'll give you 30. Uh, now let's snap out of it and realize that those imaginations are sheer fantasies because we know nothing like that would ever exist in America. And then when we realize that this is fantasy, we will have to conclude that uh, what we are faced with today is actually is race because what I just described to you mm -hmm. is real. Mm -hmm. That it actually did happen except for the fact that the racial components were, were reversed. That that happened in New York State no more than uh, four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to lay the groundwork to prove that race is indeed at the center of all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. That race has been a central factor in all major policy decisions in this country since its founding. And although we don't like to talk about it, that we're never going to get at the root of solving social problems mm -hmm. or, 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 or get to the uh, point of social justice until there's some racial justice. Thank you, Farid. Right. Thank you. You guys not going to clap it up for that? <laughs> so for you, Farid, the it is race. Excuse me? The it that we're speaking of today, what's AIDS got to I do think with it's it? Been, it's race. I think it's been race. Okay. since this country was founded and it's still raised today. Okay. So would you like to share with our guests today what the region, um, Releasing Agent People from Prisoner Campaign is about? Well, the, re the Release Agent People in uh, Prison Campaign, uh, we like to think, those of us who organize it, is mm -hmm. that it comes at this, it, this problem on different levels. Uh, the first level is the obvious trying to get elderly people who have served substantial time behind the walls to get them from behind those prison walls. Mm -hmm. These are people who have served 20, 30, 40 years, uh, and uh, they're being denied release even though they are release el eligible. And so that's the first aspect of our campaign. We also like to think that uh, our campaign goes at the heart of the matter, this punishment paradigm by focusing on uh, what we call the high hanging fruit. That is, we're not trying to reduce prison populations by getting people out that's easy to pretty much uh, uh, try to explain them needing to be released. We are going after people who have been committed serious crimes. And so that goes at that whole punishment paradigm of how much punishment is enough. Because at the, at the, at the center of punishment, uh, we, you know, I insist that the issue of race exists. One of the reasons there can be this extreme paradigm of punishment in this country is due to race. Thank you. Gabrielle, can you explain what the Raise the Age campaign is about? Sure. So New York is one of only two states in the country. The other one is North Carolina, where 16 and 17-year-olds are automatically prosecuted as adults without exception. So what that means is if a child is 16 or 17 and is arrested, they will automatically be in the adult criminal justice system. No one can change that, not a judge, no one. And a parent does not have the right to notification uh, if a child's arrested at 16 or 17, even if they're being held overnight. Parent does not have the right to be present. Child will be prosecuted in adult court, can get an adult criminal record for the rest of their life, and if detained, will be in an adult jail or prison, including Rikers Island and upstate prisons. Um, the risks to young people are tremendous. Young people in adult uh, jails are 36 times more likely to commit suicide than children in youth facilities. Again, that's 36 times more likely to commit suicide. The National Prison Rape Elimination Commission has found that young people in adult facilities are the most at risk of sexual abuse out of any population of people who are incarcerated. 
And children's brains are still developing and their sense of self, their identity, who they are, is extremely malleable. And the impact of children of being in the adult system is tremendous. And I would just point out that you know, this absolutely contradicts the way we treat children in every other sector of society. In New York State, if you're 16, you can't get a tattoo, you can't vote, you can't go to a fake tanning booth, you can't um, go to an R-rated movie. Uh, someone e even recently pointed out to me that they were in a hotel where there was a sign that said you can't swim without a parent being present in a hotel pool. But you can be held on Rikers Island and you can be questioned by the police and interrogated without your parent being notified. So we're looking through the Raise the Age campaign of the Correctional Association, working with advocates throughout the state and with policymakers to change the law, to raise the age so that kids are treated in the youth system so that if they're held in any facility, and we believe that as much as possible, children should be in communities with services, not in jails and prisons, but if children are confined, that they be in youth facilities that are developmentally appropriate and that have rehabilitative programs, and that we also have comprehensive reform of the youth justice system so that we keep as many kids as possible out of the system in the first place, so that we have services and treatment and programs for those kids who are in the system, and so that any child who interacts with the system is interacting with a child-serving system that's appropriate for their age and not a system designed for adults. And how do we do that? We do that through community organizing. We have events like the one we're at today. Uh, Tanisha goes and speaks to faith-based communities and to parent groups. Our campaign manager, Angelo Pinto, is presented across the state at colleges and universities. We've co-published a book. We have a video project that you're gonna see in a little while. And we would love to come to your schools, to your places of worship, to your community centers, to talk to people and to get involved. And our co-chair, Sophia Elijah, was appointed by Governor Cuomo to co-chair a commission that's gonna be making recommendations in December of this year to the legislature and the governor about how the age can be raised in New York State. So we're making a lot of progress, but more is needed. And really what we need is we need everyday citizens to join us. Uh, children don't have a lobby. Children don't have political power. They don't vote. They, um, are incredibly marginalized in our society, particularly children of color and particularly poor children, who are the children most impacted by the system. I'm telling you, legislators do not get many phone calls for children. They get phone calls for guns, they get phone calls for property taxes, they get phone calls for lots of things, but they don't really get many phone calls on behalf of children. And we need people like you to get involved. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Fareed, mm -hmm. Gabrielle mentioned some of the challenges that young people being housed in adult prisons are facing. Mm -hmm. Could you share with us some challenges that people aging in prison are facing? Uh, the major challenge is that prisons uh, in this country were not designed to hold the elderly. Uh, the way prisons are structured, uh, they're structured so that people can pretty much follow orders and obey in a normal fashion. When people get elderly, sometimes they move slow. Sometimes they can't hear as well as a younger person. Uh, sometimes they have uh, problems understanding orders. Mm -hmm. And what you will find is that these people will are being punished additionally punished because they can't uh, flow with the normal order of the system. And I say that's a major problem. Uh, not only that, uh, these people face uh, a sense of despair and hopelessness similar to what perhaps younger people face. Uh, when uh, you hear these, insofar as the younger people are concerned, statistics uh, of doom and gloom. Mm -hmm. uh, this is one of the reasons you hear a lot of young black men saying they don't expect to live to be 21 because of uh, the prospects of doom and gloom in their future. And you find the same thing with the elderly behind the walls because of 
the refusal of, the, of, of, a, of a penal system to recognize the ability of people to change and, uh, and, and release them after they have been uh, appropriately punished. And so my point is that uh, when we look at the scope of this whole punishment paradigm, that age don't have anything to do with it, that uh, the whole idea because the, the majority of, the, of these people are seen as the other, the whole idea is to get them when they're young and keep them when they're old. Can I speak a little about the, some of the ways, and I think, Fareed, you brought up some really incredible connections, both around race and the issue and also around some of the similarities between children and the mm. elderly in prison. And I think it's also important to think about um, sort of the most vulnerable among us, you know, and I often think like when we were first planning this conversation, I kept thinking of those adages that you can judge a society by how it treats its children, but also you can judge a society by how it, it treats its elders. And we in this country are failing both populations miserably, both inside and outside of prisons, um, but particularly inside prisons in really horrible, horrific, brutal, brutal ways. I mean, those of you who were here yesterday at the conversation on Attica, you know, just some really horrifying stories about what's happening to people inside that at the Correctional Association, you know, we bear witness to throughout our work. And I sometimes talk about children when I think about what draws me to this work as the miner's canary. So the old proverb, and it's true, right, is that miners would bring a canary down into the coal mine. And when the canary got sick and died, it signaled to the miners that it was time to get out of the mine because the air in the mine was toxic. And canaries register distress quicker than humans do. They're smaller, their respiratory systems are smaller. And I think that the same is true of children, that they are signaling for us what is happening in our society. Children register for us the failures of our society. And I think the same can be said for the elders among us, that when a society is not healthy, people who are most at risk register the toxicity more quickly than those with more resources. And then what happens in this country, right? We say like, let's kill the canary, or let's lock it up, or let's put it in a solitary confinement cell, or let's you know, take it and fail to feed it. We don't say what is going on in the mine. And so the question, right, the it is not like what's wrong with the canary and what's wrong with children and what's wrong with the elderly. It's like what is happening in our society that the mind is toxic and it's toxic for all of us. It's just registering more quickly with people who have less resources and who are more at the forefront of the system's brutality. Thank you. Faria, did you have a final thought before we tell people how to get involved? Uh, yeah, I have a final thought. And, and first of all, I'd like to say people can get involved in the rap campaign uh, by, uh, we have uh, information that we're passing out today. I would appreciate, pre appreciate it if people pick the information up and see where we are located. We are located at the Correctional Association, if you heard, uh, and our contact information is there, and you just have to specify that you like to learn more about the RAP campaign and get involved with that. Um, my final thought is that uh, this whole series of uh, panels here uh, is, uh, labeled under the uh, uh, phrase states of denial. I would say that it's a serious state of denial, very serious state of denial to think that we're gonna solve social justice and at the same time avoid ra racial justice. That central to all of this, all of this, it is the history of seeing people as the other and uh, perpetuating this whole paradigm of punishment. Thank you, Fareed.
Mm -hmm. Gabrielle, yeah. um, please let everyone know what I would say first before I tell Gabrielle to do that. It is really important, my colleagues are here and we're doing the work, but it's really important that we have people directly impacted by these issues join us to do this work. So Gabrielle, please let people know how they can get involved in the Raise the Age campaign. Sure. So um, as I mentioned before, you can invite us to come speak to your school, place of worship, community center. You can visit our website, which is correctionalassociation.org or a Facebook page. You can download materials there. You can take materials from the table at the back. You can contact your elected officials and tell them you support raising the age and getting kids out of adult jails and prisons. You can connect with Tanisha or myself um, to attend a community meeting that we have usually one Saturday a month, every month at the CA. And you can call the CA, our number's on our website, ask to speak to Tanisha, and ask for when you can come to the next community meeting where you can really plug into the campaign on a deeper level. And then I, I also wanna just talk about, um, before we close, uh, two reasons why this is incredibly important um, and why we want people to get involved. And, the first is this, um, you know, I came to this work, I used to work at Legal Aid and I was a lawyer for children in child abuse and neglect cases. And I, when I'm talking about why this issue matters to me, I often say this, that um, when I was at Legal Aid and I was working in family court, you know, I saw many parents charged with child neglect and child abuse for very serious things. But I also saw children, you know, parents charged with child neglect um, when kids didn't go to school or, you know, um, for things that were serious, but nowhere near what we are doing with state-funded taxpayer dollars. So right now, as we sit here on Rikers Island, children are in solitary confinement. You're gonna hear a little bit more about this issue later, where children are locked in a box that is incredibly small with no more than a slot in the door where food comes through, a slot in a door. Um, Children are not taken out to go to school. They may have some educational materials shoved through the door. They are denied human contact, the ability to speak to their parents or families, to make phone calls, to do almost anything. Uh, the United States, um, the rapporteur, excuse me, the UN rapporteur um, has called solitary confinement for more than 15 days torture. The average length of stay for an adolescent in Rikers Island in New York City is 43.1 days. And children can be in solitary confinement for months, for even you know many months or years on end, often for very minor reasons. So this is what I wanna say is that, how is it that our taxpayer dollars are going to pay for our government to lock children or anyone, grown up or child, in those conditions, which have been proven to shatter people psychologically and emotionally, and to devastate and traumatize them, right? We are doing that to children. If a parent did that, right? If you got frustrated with your 17-year-old at home and you locked them in their bedroom unending and you didn't allow them to go out to school and you carved a hole in the door and you shoved some food through and maybe you let them go on the balcony for an hour a day, your child will be removed from your home. ACS will come to your home, they will remove your child, they will remove all the other children in your home, and you will be arrested in criminal court for child abuse. But our criminal justice system is state-funded child abuse. And that is what's happening, is happening as we sit here. The Federal Department of Justice just issued a scathing report finding horrific brutality against children on Rikers Island. Kids do not belong in adult jails and prisons, but nobody belongs under those conditions, adult or child. It doesn't work. It's bad for public safety, and it's terrible for human beings. And the last thing I want to say, and I promise this is really the last thing, is really, promise. you know, I promise. Okay. Fareed, you know, really spoke about and is highlighting the ways that race and the criminal justice system intersect. And I can tell you, you know, when I started practicing in family court as a white woman from Staten Island, I cried the first time I sat in family court because I saw children prosecuted for the things that I did growing up in Staten Island, and I knew that the system was never going to touch me for them, right? And I smoked pot in high school, and I stole things, and I committed petty vandalism with my friends dressed as a ninja because we thought it was funny, and we didn't go to jail for that. Right? We didn't go to prison for that. 
And I, rep I remember representing a child in family court on a graffiti case and saying to the judge, like, how about we put the kid in an art program? Instead, we're sitting here spending thousands of dollars prosecuting this kid like he's a terrorist. He, like, put his name on a wall. Like, come on. This is what we're doing to people, but what does it do to a child? You know, and another story that I like to talk about because it has impacted me so greatly is sitting in family court and watching kids come in in handcuffs and some kids come in chained at the legs, right? So if we think that race has nothing to do with it, I can tell you when you watch kids, almost all black and brown kids, come into a courthouse chained at the legs, dragging chains behind them with the sound of chains moving on the sidewalk, right? The imagery, the connection to slavery is palpable. And to think that this is, this is how we treat all people in the society is not. And this is what I would watch. So I would watch kids come in and they would come in chained and they would come in handcuffed and they would be brought in and they would still be handcuffed and I would be sitting in the back because that's where the lawyers sit while you wait for your cases to be called. And the bailiff would come, they have a different name in family court because they give everything a euphemism, but the court officer would come and they would remove the children's handcuffs. And many times I saw this, the kids would be standing there and their handcuffs were removed and they would keep their hands like this. And they would stay like that. And in the family court system, in the youth justice prisons, this recently changed, but kids were also ordered used to be ordered to walk through the halls like that with their hands in that position, right? And what I have challenged people when I talk about this is to say like, what are we doing to children? And I really wanna say to anybody, again, children flag the issue for us, but this is for all people in the justice system. When we teach people to handcuff themselves, right? When we make the handcuffs invisible, when we have a system of control of human beings where what we teach people is that they are nothing but a number, that they're in a uniform and rubber shoes where they have no humanity that is given to them, right? People retain that for themselves, but the system is conspiring to take it and ground it and grind people down and make them feel like they're nothing. That is our system of punishment. And what does that do to all of us and what does that do to the people inside? And it sets us all up for failure. It devastates people and it doesn't work. And so our campaign is about changing that for children, but it's really about transforming the entire way our society looks at how do we handle when people have done something wrong, we need to have a response. But that response doesn't have to be torture, it doesn't have to be brutality, and it doesn't have to be something that takes away from all our humanity. Thank you. And that speaks for both populations. We're talking about children and aging people in prison, so that definitely speaks for both populations. Yeah. Gabrielle and Farid are very passionate about the work that they're doing, so please join me in just uh, thanking them for sharing their experiences and work with us. Thank you, T. Mm -hmm. Gabrielle, Gabrielle spoke a bit about solitary confinement. So as they, for reading Gabrielle, leave the stage, we're gonna show a little clip about that. Thank you. Thank you. Why well, put a young person through the torture of the box? It breaks you down mentally. I went to the box, the being solitary confinement, the who scale, the shoe. I went to solitary in 2005 with a tobacco possession. Uh, they gave me 15 days. So that was my first time in the box. And then I did 120 days in solitary, but upstate though, I did six months. That was brutal. After your first day, that's when your mind starts to play tricks on you, but not, not too bad, not that much. It's still bearable, but you can still kind of ignore it. And then that's when you, you know, your thoughts start running wild and then before you know it, you actually start speaking out your thoughts. When I would get a visit and they would bring me like, you know, crossword puzzle books or, you know, bring me like a little pad to write on or something, I, I wouldn't get it. Like, I was ready to pull my hair out. I got just tired of talking on the gate to try to occupy my mind. Got tired of talking to myself, got tired of screaming out the window. 
tired of pacing back and forth, reminiscing about what I used to do when I was in the street, and now I'm sitting in here in this box. I just started getting very angry, then I started getting very sad at the same time, then I started getting very anxious. Young people don't need to be in anybody's jail, detention center, period. What they need, they really do need some type of services, some place where they really can be re rehabilitated, you know, a place where it's more therapeutic and not, and not more oppressing. So as I mentioned earlier, the work that we're doing is important, but it's more important that we involve the voices and experiences of people directly impacted by these issues. I'm going to ask a couple of guests to join me on the stage. Um, but before I welcome them up, I just want to tell you a bit about these people that will be joining us. The young man you just saw in the clip, Ismael Nazario, will be joining us. He's 25 years old and he's a Brooklyn native. He currently works at the Fortune Society as a case manager for a program called ICANN, which stands for Individualized Corrections Achievement Network, which aids individuals that are at high risk of recidivism. He previously worked for the Center for Community Alternatives with the New Services Department, dealing with court-involved young people ages 12 to 17, which brought forth a stronger passion for him to help young people um, and be the voice that they need to, to support themselves. Also joining us will be Gloria Ribeiro. Gloria spent 26 years in prison, saw five parole boards, and came home at 56 years old. She had several strokes before her first parole board. Gloria Ribeiro received her associates and bachelor's degrees while incarcerated. She was a peer counselor in HIV and AIDS work, and did construction and maintenance work. When she came home, she first worked as a maintenance job, worked on a maintenance job, and then was employed by the New York Harm Reduction Educators, working on HIV testing and outreach in Manhattan and the Bronx. The third person we're gonna have join us is Terrell Muhammad. Terrell Muhammad currently works at the Correctional Association. He is a formerly incarcerated person who has now committed himself to supporting young people and speaking out for people who have experienced time inside as well as solitary confinement. Our fourth person who's gonna join us, his name is Saigon. He is a rapper and actor. He also spent time in an adult facility as a young person. He now has made a commitment to use his talents and his art to speak about his experiences and to encourage young people. So please, please, please give me some positive energy and welcome and help me welcome our panelists to the stage. Hi, how you Good doing? to see you guys today. See you. So we're just going to get right into this because it's important that your voices are heard on this issue. So Ismael, yes. um, we just saw a clip, a very moving clip, by the way. Who agrees with that? Okay. So in the clip, you shared that youth don't belong in prison. What do you see as effective alternatives for young people today? Um, well like a lot of the great work that you do, um, you definitely need mentors. They need, they need something to stimulate their minds. You know, granted, yeah, they did make a mistake and committed a crime, fine. We all make mistakes. Everybody did things that we're not proud of, we're ashamed of. Um, everybody has at one point in time in their life. However, with these young people that we're speaking about, they do need something to help them realize that they made a mistake and how to correct it and move forward from it and not stay stuck on it and keep committing the same things over and over or just getting worse. Because placing them inside jail, prison, 
what is it really doing, right? You're putting a young person in a hostile environment, and what do you expect to come out of that experience for this young person? It's that much harder on that young person to come out of that experience and really make a, 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 a drastic change. So, of course, they need some type of recreation, mentoring, um, some type of therapeutic services to, to, to really tap into them in the cell so they can figure out who they really are and what they really want to be. Okay, I agree, definitely. And Mohammed, hey, you had a similar, well, you had an experience in solitary confinement as well. Would you like to share with us a bit of how that has impacted you? Well, I spent seven years in solitary confinement. I went to prison at age 19 and I got out at 45. I've been in every maximum security prison in New York State twice. And when I went to solitary confinement, I was 20. Um, I've been in the Bing in 1979. When you got sentenced and you went upstate, they put you automatically in the Bing. No disciplinary, just because you got sentenced and it was time for you to go upstate. And then when I went upstate, I was in Elmira. And I'm from Elmira, I went to Auburn, and at Auburn, I was the youngest person in this facility. I was 20, and I was there with men. But because I was an athlete, I didn't take into consideration my experience or what was going on. So I, you know, I didn't disobey any orders or any rule infraction. I was just being a young man in an environment where I was trying to find myself. And doing that in prison would put you in the box. So I went to the box. I went to the box because I didn't get to my cell in time. They have a count. And because, you know, I think this is something like a Coney Island, I don't know the, the real rash realities of it. I missed the count. And they put me in the box. I got six months. My first six months in the box, as Israel was saying, was pure madness. You know, I, it got to the point where as not only was I speaking out involuntarily, but paint chips that were in the cell became figurines. I would start imagining that I'm looking at Abraham Lincoln, or I'm looking at something that um, a basketball player on the wall, because I was dealing with the rash reality of being in an environment that's abnormal, but I'm losing my mind at the same time. And it was a daily struggle. It was a struggle for seven years to stay lucid and sane. See, you know, it's just by the grace of God that I'm able to be here to have this conversation with you, because you'll be talking to a man. Thank you for sharing. So I want to hop over to Saigon for a second, because we know that you went inside at the age of 16 and came out at the age of 22. Mm -hmm. What would you like to share just about that experience? Um, to echo what both of these brothers have said, um, first things first is a 16-year-old is a child. I look back now when I was 16, and I see 16-year-olds now, and I go, this kid is clueless. You're oblivious to so, much, so many things in life when you're 16 years old. So for somebody to take a mistake you made and subject you to those kind of conditions, and, and hold you responsible and accountable for something you did at 16 years old and say, you're gonna be in a position where it's gonna probably affect the rest of your life is, is, is nonsense. It doesn't even make any kind of sense when you look at it, you know, because we all gonna make mistakes. Growing as a human being is a part of life and part of growing up is, you know, trial and error. Sometimes we, we do things we can't take back, but, and, and in our communities, unfortunately, you know, a lot of us are raised by our mothers without our fathers there. So when we, when we don't have that sense of, you know, leadership and, and guidance from a man, not a, not a, a male, a man, it, it, it leaves you like, and then they throw you in a situation where you become, you, you, you're, you could be victimized because the, the older guy's proud, they proud on the younger guys. You can go to your cell and, there, and there's a joint under your pillow and you go, oh man, somebody left me a joint. And if you smoke that joint, you come back and there's a bag of laundry there. 
And then the dude goes, oh, you got that joint? You go, yeah, good looking out, thinking somebody looked out for you. And now nah, he goes, nah, you got to wash that laundry. So now you're like, what are you talking about? Yeah, you got to take care of that laundry because they know you're a child. They know you don't really know no better. So then you go, oh, now you got to you got to do one or two things because you got you're in prison. You got to either do that laundry, and then next thing you know, there's a pile of laundry like this in front of your cell, or you got to go say, oh, I got to I got to defend myself. I got to make a statement and let people know I'm not going to be a victim. And all of this, you you put in this harsh condition, which is like he said, is a mental is mental torture in a way, so to speak, for a child because of a mistake you made as a 16 year old. And we got to do something collectively to change that. I agree. So Gloria, you're representing for the ladies. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> these guys have used their words to paint a picture for our guests about their experience. How, what picture would you like to paint for us today? What would you like to share about your experience? Yes, Gloria. I don't know. Um, women's jails and men's jails are totally different. Um, I can't say they're warm, but I'm saying they help each other out in some sense. If somebody get hurt, the women will help you. They won't abandon you, you know. Um, they look out for each other. They feed one another if they're hungry. Is our support system in some sense of the way inside? Um, they care. They take care of each other. That's all I got to say okay. about the women's inside the system. Okay. Because they don't take care of us. That's for sure. Okay. <laughs> you know. So let's talk about that. We talked earlier with Farid about releasing aging people from prison. And we talked about some, he touched a little bit on health concerns. Mm -hmm. So when you say they don't take care of us, can you tell us more about any health challenges that you faced while you were away? <laughs> they used to call me around 2 o'clock in the morning. I was their um, plumber, electrician. Any um, maintenance jobs, they used to call me at any time of the day. I used to work sometimes all night and all day. One time I got sick. And um, over there, you've got to see nurse's screen. You don't see the doctor. You see a nurse. She um, tells me, oh, you got asthma. I said, no, it doesn't feel like asthma. I know what asthma feels like. I had it all my life. This is, doesn't feel like I was losing a lot of weight. And um, kept on going, kept on going. It took me a month and a half so they could take me out to take x-rays and find out that I had walking pneumonia. Then I went to another facility. I was trapped in one building, which I was used to be exposed in an open ground. The stress just took over me, and um, I got two strokes in that jail. And um, the women were the one that took me downstairs to the nurse. And um, when they took me downstairs, the doctor was just coming in the same time, and she saw me. She said, Stevie. You're having a heart attack or a stroke. She signed the papers because you can't go out unless they sign papers out to take you to the outside hospital. After seven days one time, six days the other. And like I said, with the women, they look after each other. Women fell down on the floor. We used to get a stretcher, eight of us, depending on the weight of the woman, carried up to the hospital. It's always with us. Doctors. <laughs> Whenever they were there, you know, but you had to see a nurse first, always. They don't know what your, your, your illness are, really. Thank you for sharing that. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Mohammed, you have a very interesting way of expressing sort of the health needs of young people and adults, and aging people, excuse me. Would you like to share that with our guests today? Oh, I remember when, when I was young, you know, like I, I thought I was a pretty good athlete. So when you're young, you, you don't have any health problems. So you can go in prison 10, 15 years, if you're like 19 to 25 or 30, without even going to sick call or anything like that. But then when you get like 35, 40, 
You start developing illnesses like high blood pressure, cholesterol, arthritis from playing basketball and sports too much. And then you start to noticing because when you're young, you think you're invincible. You're going to last forever. But then when time go by and these illnesses come, you have a different thought and reality into you now. Like, I don't want to die in here. You know, I want to get out. I want to live. But you want to have a purpose and, you know, a, a desire to live. Many men who do get out at advanced age, they have serious health problems once they get out. And it's hard to access the, the necessary medical needs once you get out because many of us never filled out paperwork for Medicaid or insurance. So these are new phenomena to us. And many of the men get frustrated and tired because they become so introvert, they don't want people to know their business. But knowing your business is a way to get the help you need, and they don't know how to navigate that yet. So these are some of the differences and some of the experiences one will go through from a young man to an older man once you do time. Thank you. True. Ismael, I read in your bio that you're, you're currently at the Fortune Society and you've done work with other organizations to support young people. So my question for you is, having this experience in solitary confinement, how has that impacted you in your work as well as just your everyday life? <clears throat> um, well now, in this day, I'm not really gonna say it impacts me or it affects me in any type of way. Um, pretty much it, 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 how it affected me then, mm -hmm. You know, you, you got to take into consideration what solitary confinement is really designed for, right? It's punishment on top of punishment. And I say that meaning jail is punishment. So going to the box is additional punishment. So you're being punished on top of being punished. And another nickname for solitary confinement, believe it or not, is jail. Is it that ironic? So, um, I mean, when I, when I revisit it and I speak about my experience being in solitary confinement, uh, I mean, that's the only time, like, I guess you could say the, 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 the trauma comes back from that experience because I have to speak about it and, and things like that, but it really doesn't bother me or affect me to that point because I feel people need to, need to hear and understand what it's really like being in a six by eight cell, 23 hours out of the day, every day, you know, <clears throat> but what I try to do is just have people understand and the young people that I work with understand that you don't want to go through that. You don't want to have to live, you don't want to have to live that type of life. You don't, you, you, you don't need that experience under your belt. Thank you. I'm going to go back to Saigon for a minute because you talked about, you know, young people should, you know, you were talking about like about alternatives and we need to work on this collectively. So take us backwards for a minute when you were released when you were 22 years old. Uh -huh. What was that like for you re-entering the community? I was 22 physically, but I was still 16. Because I, I, you know, and there they don't encourage you to go to school. You know, I, I remember I went, to, I went, got locked up in 1995 and Pat Governor Pataki had taken all the college courses out of, you know, the state. So once I got, I was, I was pretty smart as a kid, so I got, I took the GED, <clears throat> I took my GED test and I got my GED when I was about 16 years old. So that I was, I wanted to, you know, further my education, but there was nothing available for me to, you know, there was nothing else there. They was like, oh, you got your GED, go to the yard. <laughs> go to the yard, go lift some weights, go play some basketball. And, and there's nobody really there encouraging you saying, hey, you need to stay on par with your age group. And, you know, you know, college wasn't available, they had took that. So I had hit my, my pinnacle, my peak of education in the system. So, you know, when I did come home and I'm 22 years old, I realized like, whoa, these kids are, I'm, these are college kids. The kids who I, I was growing up with, they all, in college, ready to, some of the ones that did go to college, they ready to graduate college, and I'm like, wow, man, I'm still that same kid. 
So that's the reason why I said I got to figure out something. It took my insight to say, what can I do? I could have went back to school, but it's almost like, you know, I felt like all that time was lost because like he said, we become introverts. We, we become so into ourselves because I did time in the box too. So you become so in tune with yourself, you really don't even care about other people at some point. You start to be like, you know, nobody care about me. So why should I care about anybody else? And it's a sickness, it's like a sickness that it's kind of like you can't even really help it. So what I did, I was like, there's this one thing that you could do that you don't, that you don't really have to have no qualifications for, and that's rapping. <laughs> you know, you don't, have, you don't need to have a GED. Actually, the more your gangster tales you could tell, the better off you could do. And once I seen that, I was like, I'm gonna sneak my way into this music business, but instead of me talking about the hardships of my life, and glorifying it, I'm going to do what my man's doing with these kids. And I'm going to say, I'm going to tell them why they shouldn't pick up a gun. That's right. You know? I'm going to tell them. I'm going to tell them the hard sides, the, the harsh realities of joining the gang. It's funny because when you look at the artists that's out there, the, the little Waynes and, the, you know, the, the, the guys who talk about shoot them up, Sue Wu Gang, Bloods, Crips, that's, they showed a little fancy dance. They showed a little the rag hanging out the pocket, but they don't show the mother crying over the casket mm. at the funeral. Mm -hmm. They don't show those images in the videos. They don't show the collateral damage that when you shoot somebody and you kill somebody, it's, it's, he's probably the best, I hate to say it, but he's probably the best one off because we don't know where he's going, but we know his mother's gonna be crying. We know you're going to the, to the box. We know you kill somebody's brother, you kill somebody's nephew. So the collateral damage that you affect when you go out and you commit these crimes, we don't, you know, the, these artists who I feel are, are in an influential place mm -hmm. to, 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 to raise our children need to be doing more because kids look up to these rappers. I believe that's our most powerful weapon that we have right now because a kid could tell you everybody, they, they could quote rap lyrics but can't tell you, you know, 10 of the 50 presidents or the 50 states, I'm sorry. They can't, they can't do that. They could tell you every member of the Wu-Tang Clan, but they can't tell you uh, simple things like, you know, the smallest little things, man. It, it, and it's sad to see because it's like we're, we're, we're where do we, as, as a, the, the, the elders now, the elders, where do we step in and say, we got to do something about this? And that's what I'm trying to figure out. That's actually a great question, because I wanted to go to Gloria, because you talked a lot about, when you just spoke, about they didn't take care of us, we had to take care of ourselves. You guys had to pull together and get things done. Could you talk a bit more about what needs to be done to support people who are aging in prison? To let them out. I'm <laughs> down with that. I'm <laughs> down with that. For real, all right. Don't get time. You know, um, they can't hurt nobody. They're aging. The things that they used to do when they were 20 or 30, can't do, they can't do now. Not even that, as fast as they want to. You can have, um, <laughs> You can have an education. People don't want to hire you because of your age. They want somebody younger. So what if the education is helping you out in there for too? Mm -hmm. Unless you know people, unless you have contact with people, you're doomed. You know, and um, I think they need some place to go when they come out because they don't know the system is, you come into a futuristic world back in I don't know what year mm -hmm. inside you don't know you don't know nothing about for cell phones Medicaid shelters and things like that metro cards nothing you know you don't have no credit scores so when you come out you are lost so they need some place to go and tell them and somebody that's been there mm -hmm. that could show them the way mm -hmm. you know for them to me it's time to let them go. If the risk is low, let them go. Right, Rap? Right? Yes. Right. So I, I have a say couple. one more thing? Sure. It doesn't help. It. I don't care how many years you give them after the, um, the time they had. 
they're still the same person. You know, I mean, not the same person when they came in, another person, but I'm just saying they're older. They ain't gonna do, hurt nobody. Mm -hmm. So why keep them in there? Why take that space? Mm -hmm. You know, and why use all that money? Mm -hmm. and where is it going to? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Both Saigon and Ismael talked a bit about young people and them needing support and mentors. Uh, Mohammed, would you like to share anything about the work that you do to support young people? Well, when I came home, I noticed that we had a population of young black males who were disinterested in everything. Um, they were unemployable. It was hard for them to be responsible for anything. So I created a business. I, I, I did security on a executive protection level for many artists uh, and many celebrities. And what I did was I would hire them. I would see a guy that was what we call a man child. <laughs> you see? He's 17, 18, 19, 20, but he's like 6'5", 245. And I would train him. I would train him on how to be a man, how to be respectful, how to be responsible, because he knew how to do security automatically, because he knew how to survive. Yeah. And that's all he needed to know how to do, survive. I can teach him the rest. And once I gave him these trainings, I said, you can't come to work with a do-rag on. I said, I don't pay you to wear a baseball hat. You can't swag your pants. You know, and I changed their attire and their behavior, and they, they acquiesced. You know, and they would like tell people like, yo, man, you want a job, man, go see Muhammad, man. But I always told them, I said, listen, you gotta invest in yourself before I invest in you. Mm -hmm. All I'm asking you to do some of the things that I'm not telling you, but that I do. You know, I try not to preach to the choir. I try to lead the choir by example. Mm -hmm. That's right. Later. See, and these men, now they work, they have jobs, they take care of their families, and they're responsible people in their communities today. I even have young men that's in college now in Division One basketball, you see, so I know that when men step in, as you say, men can make a difference. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great. Absolutely. Thanks. So, we have about five more minutes, and I want to actually take this time to get some closing remarks from my panelists. So today we've been talking about incarcerating children and the elderly. So you have the air. We're going to pretend that you have the air of the world right now. And in your closing remarks, I would like you to share why is it important that we stop incarcerating our children and the elderly and stop incarcerating families in our community? And I want Saigon to start. I would say first to these prosecutors, these judges, these ADAs, think of it if it was your child. Would you want to see your child be subjected to the same conditions you're about to subject somebody else's child to? Because, you know, when it hits home, that's when we want to be like, hey, hey, wait, wait a minute. But you're quick to do it to somebody else's child. So it, I think what, what they need to do is, is well, forget them, what we need to do first. That's right. What we need to do first, for the young women, men and women in our community, we need to build, we need to build self-esteem centers or something. We need to build up our self-esteem as children, because as as a youth and, and all together. Because you see these young ladies who's, you know, these social networks they're using their sexuality to, to get attention for likes and views, and because you know that that's how they build up their self-esteem. And it, it's it's so sad. You see these young brothers who feel like they need a gun or they need to join a gang to feel like they're alive or they're a part of something. And that starts within us because if we don't put them in a position where they can lock up our children, then we won't be getting locked up. So we gotta, it starts really within us and, 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 and our parents. If you have children, you gotta, like he said, you gotta, you gotta teach these children to invest in themselves and teach them the importance of their future and not to throw their lives away. And I think that's that, first where we need to start. Once we get that, we'll, we'll see less and less and less of our children being incarcerated when we start at home and give them strong foundations. Thank you, Saigon. Gloria? I think 
some for me, I just think sometimes it's the money wise because like parents both work, they don't have no kind, the kids have no kind of support system because the parents are trying to reach their goals to, you know, bring them up. The kids are by themselves. They don't have nobody to go and nowhere to go to, to do anything. So they be outside in the street, to, um, hanging around, trying to be with somebody, trying to be, like he says, with a gang or with people that um, let them in to be their family part, you know? And I think they should make centers um, for them to go to for music, for rap, for dancing, any kind of um, system that will work to keep them out of the streets so they could have some place to go. Because while their parents are not there, like everybody else, they're going to go play. And they get themselves into more mischief and more problems <laughs> that, than they're worth sometimes. You know, because the parent is not thinking, oh my, not my child. You want to cover the sky with your hand, knowing that your child might be doing wrong. So I think they should make more centers, and like I said, like music and things. Nowadays, computers, electronics, they love all them things. They'd be there for hours. <laughs> and they know how to take you to another spot in the world, which I don't even know, but I'm just saying, mm -hmm. you know, that's what they need, somewhere to, where they could go. Thank you, Gloria. And parents, you know, to really, really stay in tune with their kids, too. They don't. Yeah. They be so busy working in their jobs and everything, they forget about them, too. Okay, thank you. So, Mohammed, you have the air of the world. What does the world need to know about this issue and what we're talking about today? If we say our greatest resources are our children, but we treat our children like trash, then we're lying to the world. Our greatest resource are our children. Because when they come into the world, they have the answers for all the ills that affect us. If we're looking for the cure for cancer or AIDS, it's gonna come through our children. And if we don't protect them and guide them and nurture them and invest in them, then we're doomed to die. Mm -hmm. So if you wanna live, invest in and protect our most natural and precious resources, which our children is. Awesome. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> um, I was. Everybody just, you know, said it all. You know, I don't even know how I could follow that. But um, basically, what I what I would like to put out there is, you know, it. You would get different dollar amounts to how much it actually is to house an adolescent in on Rikers Island and upstate, right? You would hear different. It ranges between thirty-five thousand and sixty sixty thousand dollars to house um, an inmate, a detainee, however you want to frame it as, right? So for our young people, as well as the older individuals, why keep wasting that money? to house these people in these facilities, right? For, well, for the older people, why keep wasting this money to house these people in these facilities and not release them and put that money towards services for these in individuals when they are released back into society, right? Now, for our young people, on the other hand, right, it's unfortunate that our young people in our communities, they already have so many different things weighing against them, right? So they turn to the streets, they have negative influences, peer influences, and older influences that make them want to gravitate towards that type of lifestyle in the first place. So they make a mistake, commit a crime. Now you're using, once again, all these thousands of dollars to house this young person in jail instead of putting them in an alternative to incarceration program where they can receive certain services and actually benefit from it instead of putting them in a hostile environment where it could possibly break this young person. Thank you. Did I cut you off or were you complete? No, I'm finished. I don't want to get too much into okay, it. Okay, <laughs> that's fine. So can we take a second to clap it up for our panelists?
They were awesome. And I enjoyed learning more about you guys and hearing your experiences. The audience, you guys will have an opportunity soon to ask them some questions. But before we get into that, we're actually going to see a clip right now. Mohamed Koti is believed to be 87 years old. He was sentenced to 25 years to life in 1978 for opening fire on a police officer who survived. He needs a wheelchair to get around. He's hard of hearing and suffers from a long list of ailments. He's been turned down for parole more than six times. Koti's incarceration and that of other seniors like him have sparked a movement to get elderly prisoners out of jail after they have served their time. It's my personal mission because of exactly what happened to me. 64-year-old Mujahid Farid is founder of a grassroots coalition called Release Aging People in Prison, or RAP. As a young man, Farid got into trouble with the law and was sentenced in 1978 to 15 years to life. He served 33 years. He was denied parole eight times and was released at the age of 62. When you talk about seniors, the uh, recidivism rate is, you know, in the single digits. Statistics show the recidivism rate for the general population is about 40 percent, but for senior citizens, it's about 3 percent. Farid argues keeping the elderly behind bars is counterproductive. It would save the public money. It would save the useless uh, 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 confining of people. Larry White is 79 years old and was incarcerated for 32 years. He was denied parole four times. They have no harm when they go on the street. Their capacity to, to commit a crime is practically nil. We see some change, and I'm hopeful that there will be more. I definitely think that the public is more aware of these issues. State prison records show that as of January 2013, there are more than 9,000 prisoners over the age of 50, representing about 15 percent of the prison population. The RAP campaign holds workshops with hopes that prisoners are given fair and inclusive release consideration when appearing before parole boards. In Harlem, Cheryl Wills, New York. <laughs> Everyone has been listening to everyone and every, all of the information we've been sharing. So now we're going to do some Q&A with our panelists. Is that okay, panelists? Yeah. Cool. So we have some people stationed in the auditorium who will bring you a mic if you have a question. So this is question and answer, right? It's not announcements, right? <laughs> so I want to really honor the time that we have so you guys can ask questions and really hear more from our panelists. We also have Gabrielle and Farid still with us, so if you have questions for them from their earlier presentation, you can ask them at this time as well. So who has a question? I know somebody does. Hi. I'll make it real quick. My name's Laura Whitehorn and I work with RAP and I just did want to say that Coty, who was in the video, just got parole and that that shows that there is an impact of all this work. So my question for the panelists is what impact do you see since you've gotten out in all the attention that has been brought to mass incarceration? Can you see a difference? Are there examples you see among the people you know of things that are already changing? Not just what the campaigns are changing, although that too, but what is changing in the consciousness of people in your community and yourselves? Um, one thing I've seen is, I don't, I don't know if this relates directly, is um, when they change those drug laws, I know, man, a lot, of, a lot of people were locked up for a long time for some stupid drug laws. I knew dudes who was sold $30, $40 worth of crack and was doing 15, 20 years for it. There's no way you could tell me that selling $20, $30 worth of drugs is worth 20 years of somebody's life. So fortunately, you know, I don't know, it was the, was the Rockefeller law, whatever it was, you know, they, they altered it or changed it. And I know a lot of people came home, which was a good thing. Is there someone else from the panel who wants to respond to that? Yes. Um, the Drop the Rock campaign was like a, a watershed of enlightenment for many people with taxpayers because they got to understand, you know, what was actually happening from a racial 
um, standpoint of discrimination, and also from a monetary standpoint. See, I, I, you know, I, in the black community, we don't get the monetary aspect of it, but we get the racial aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And in the white community, they don't get the racial aspect of it, they get the monetary aspect of it. So when you start talking dollars and cents, people start to understand that, hey, man, you know, my money's being misappropriated, and we need to do something about it. And you started seeing states start to become bankrupt. Yeah. Their economies start to be affected. See, we was always poor. So we don't get the dollars and cents. Mm -hmm. But what we get the racial disparities. That's right. So we talk in two different audiences and two different languages. So when Drop the Rock came, that audience became one. Wow. See, and many people got involved. Whites, blacks, Hispanics, everybody got involved. Because everybody had a vested interest in that campaign. Wow. So now I see today more people are informed about criminal justice issues. Mm -hmm. More people are more active today. And it's important that we become more active and more participation. Those of you sitting in the audience, you, you on the fence right now, it's time to get off the fence. That's right. It's time to get involved with some of these campaigns. Because guess what? This is not going away. This is a call to action today. That's right. Get involved. That's right. Listen to him. Do we have another question? Hi, uh, my name is Sarah David Chinzy. I work with the Stop Mass Incarceration Network. Uh, New York is one of two states. I don't know if this was addressed um, before um, I came in a little late. Um, who sentenced 16 year olds as adults? And I'd like to know what is happening, or is there anything happening legislature-wise or movement-wise to address just the heinous situation that we're in? And just a little anecdote, I was reading about uh, Louis Armstrong Satchmo, got into some trouble as a teenager, 13 or 14 years old, down in Louisiana. He, in the deep south, he was sentenced or not sentenced, he was sent to what they called a reform school where he learned to play the trumpet. So what are we doing now? <laughs> wow. it's, 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 it's funny you say that because I'm, I'm a direct experience for that. When I was, when I caught my little crime, I did my little crime, I thought I could elude the law, you know, I thought I was going on the lam. So I, I went down to Virginia, which is a commonwealth, and they caught me in Virginia. I got caught in Virginia. So, you know, I thought I was being slick. I'm like, I want to fight extradition, you know. I, I, I don't know why, why they got me locked up. But I was 16 years old, and they put me with other children. And it was kind of like, it made sense. It was like, okay, we all made a mistake, but I was amongst kids, my peers, you know. So, so we acted like children. All the youthful expression and all of that, that's what we were in there doing. We weren't in there, you know, scheming and plotting. We were in there, you know. Playing, playing cards and having fun, being children. And then when New York came and got me and extradited me, they put me with adults. The same crime, just did two different states, two different legislatures, two different laws. So when I got to New York and they put, it was like a, it was a shock because now I'm not with children anymore. Now I'm with a guy that's just 32 years old and he want my cookies. And I'd be like, hold on man, I'm not, I'm not ready to give up my cookies, you know what I'm mean? saying? But he won't, he, 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 you know, and so that was a culture shock. And, and if you even look at the middle middle America, where these kids do heinous crimes, you know, at 18 they give them a clean slate. Not only do they not charge them as adults, but they give them a clean record at 18 and say, okay, now you're an adult. Now you can go live your life. But that New York definitely has to change that law. It, it's heinous and it's, it's, it's very bad. Thanks for asking that great question. We talked a bit about it earlier. Gabrielle Herbert's Prisco is also going to talk to you a bit about the landscape of the legislation. Thanks. So before we spoke a little bit about the campaign and just to remind people that ways you can get involved to change the age of criminal responsibility in New York is you can 
invite us to come speak. There's materials outside. You can check out our website. And we did have a pretty extensive conversation about the issue earlier on in the panel. And just to talk about, like, Saigon's experience, I think, really puts uh, a face and a heart and a lived experience on the reality for so many young people who are in New York's adult jails and prisons. And also, there's a strong research base that shows that these um, approaches that prosecuting children as adults not only fails individuals is terrifying for children but it fails public safety when children are prosecuted as adults they are more likely to go on to commit future crime and violence than when they are treated in the youth system when they get the kinds of services and support they need when they have access to developmentally appropriate services and when even the screening instruments that are used in the adult system the kinds of instruments that are used the psychological profiles and other instruments are not even normed for children and so the whole mechanism of the criminal justice system is designed first of all terribly for everyone including adults but really does not fit the developmental age and of children. And so some of the things that we can do and what's happening is there's a commission I mentioned earlier that's about to make recommendations about how the age should be raised. And what we really need people to do is to contact their legislators and to say that you support raising the age of criminal responsibility and you support getting kids out of jails and prisons. And you can contact the CA if you need more help on how to message that. We also have materials in the back and on our website. Thanks. Thank you. And I can pass the mic to the next question. Thank you. Hi, first of all, I just want to thank all of you for this incredible program. It, I wish, I hope many, many others see it as well. I mean, um, I'm active in rap now, and um, I do know Mr. Cote. <laughs> <laughs> um, just spoke to him today. Anyhow. But I'm interested in the youth also. I was fortunate enough, um, just, I don't know, because of being a teacher, I guess, to go to uh, Greaterford Prison, and I met some people, uh, one in particular who had been incarcerated since he was 15. And um, that had an incredible impact on me. And uh, I'm just wondering uh, what kind of movement there is in New York that is taking in, you know, working with the traction that we've got through the Supreme Court decision of, uh, you know, now juveniles cannot be uh, tried as adult, or they can't be, sorry, that's not it, they can't be automatically given um, per, with life without parole, LWOP. And it seems to me a lot of those arguments are really, really important, having to do with neuroscience and. And I just, I'm just hoping that, that a lot is being based on that because I think there's a movement. That's a landmark decision. That's, that's a watershed, as, as, to use your expression, uh, that, that that now is supposed to be, although in Pennsylvania they're fighting it and, there, and there's a, a case now with uh, Campus Songster who's challenged it and, and because they, they don't want it to be, apply retroactively. So my question is, um, is there something where more people are being urged to, to go to prison? I mean, I know that was incredibly important to me, uh, especially white people, getting back to what James Baldwin has said about relatively conscious whites getting involved who have some privilege. I mean, I think that's one thing, you know, reaching out to more people and using uh, that Supreme Court decision is, is another, and decarcerate PA, is there something in uh, New York like decarcerate PA where, you know, they're emphasizing all these schools are closing and yet they're building more and more prisons or expanding more and more prisons in Pennsylvania, but I don't know how much New York is doing with that regard. So I have several like, questions. I hope that isn't too many. So I'm going to ask that we just try to address your one, your last one, I think, about are there any movements to, de to sort of drop the rate of incarceration of young people? Is that what you're asking? Well, what are the movements? You know, I'm making connections like you were suggesting, you know, that it's systemic, that there's taxpayer money that's going to keep old people and young people who shouldn't be incarcerated in prison. Mm -hmm. And in Pennsylvania, they're tying it up with decarcerate PA, educate, don't incarcerate, mm -hmm. you know, like looking at the system, not just, and, and the way it's affecting everybody, uh, people who are paying taxes as well as people who are uh, oppressed. 
Is there someone on the panel who has a response to that? I have a little pinto just to get in. Uh, he's the campaign manager for uh, Raise the Age. And but would you stand up for a minute? <laughs> This was on the table, how to get more people involved and to actually call, coalition our efforts together to bring this issue to light. And this is what's being done. If you take a look around the room, you'll see there's a lot of good, well-meaning white folks here. You see? So they're here. <laughs> they're not going anywhere. They're involved. But the crux of the matter is that we have to get more of the grassroots level of the people that's directly involved and affected. The black and Latino community has to get involved. And once we can merge and marriage these two communities, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Legislation will be passed. Politicians will be hearing us, because we'll be speaking in one voice. Right now, we're a little fractured. But as long as we have this discussion, it will get there. And it's going to be an uphill battle, understand it. Doing what we're doing is not an overnight sensation. But as long as you're in the fight, we're going to win. That's right. And that's the that's that's actual fact. Right. Thanks. Back. We, ha we have a couple of, oh. Yes, See, I just wanted to add to that. So the Correctional Association has been advocating to downsize the prison system in New York State for decades. And finally, the governor started closing prisons and closing youth facilities. So that long preceded decarcerate. We work in tandem with decarcerate. But one of the major um, issues for the Correctional Association is to downsize the prison industrial complex, starting with New York State. So I just want you to know that's going on, been going on for a long time here. Thank you. Thanks, Sophia. We have a couple of more minutes for questions. I want to remind everyone that Fareed and Gabrielle are also still available for questions. Uh, hi, my name is Sarah. I work at the Bronx Defenders, criminal defense attorney, and um, uh, thank you so much for sharing your stories today. Very briefly, um, Muhammad, you talked about how the first six months of, uh, I think, seven years of solitary, you said that they, they felt like madness to you. And I'm wondering from all of you, any of you who've served in solitary, um, what got you through? And if you, um, you know, looking back from where you are now, what's gotten you through even since your release? Uh, and what kind of support would you have wanted when you were in solitary or after solitary from, for example, your criminal defense attorney? <laughs> Well, I'm not even going to go there about the criminal defense right. attorney. Uh, what really got me through is this. They have an antiquated law library in the library inside. And the general library used to have National Geographics from like 1930. So I used to read National Geographics to travel the world. I used to read Reader's Digest to travel the world. I used to read Fortune magazine. Uh, Forbes, Basketball Digest, New York Times, Time Magazine, Ebony, Jet. <laughs> you know, to say, like, I read everything that I can get my hands on. Because, you know, if you just leave, leave it up to your own devices with nothing, I'd be stopped raving mad on medication. And I had problems, believe me, when, when released. You know, I, 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 I remember, and I tell this story, I said, I couldn't walk a full New York City block my first week home. No, nothing was stopping me. No one would prevent me from doing that. It's just that for so long, I was always told where to go and where to stop that when I, I was able to do it on my own, I couldn't do it on my own accord. And I started crying because I said, something wrong with me, man. Why can't I walk this block? And I had to battle through that. And how I battled through that, I called other people who were in the same condition I was. I called Exodus, a 
friend of mine named Julio Medina. He's executive director there. And then once I called him, it was a relief because I was talking to somebody who's been where I've been at. And they got me through it. So, you know, only those who've been through what you've been through can help you go through what you're going through. Mm. Your family love you. Your friends love you. But they really don't understand. That's right. Thank you so much, Mohammed. We've actually run out of time for the questions and answers. However, our panelists will still be around afterwards if you, wanna, if you need a question to ask them or if you want to take a picture with them. Um, so now, first of all, let's clap it up for our panelists again. As if the day wasn't already exciting enough, we're about to actually have a performance by, <laughs> by a wonderful brother and advocate and performer who also does work with young people on Rikers Island. So as the panelists exit the stage, we're gonna have Messiah come to the stage. Peace and love. How you doing? All right. I'd like to thank uh, the Correctional Association, the Juvenile Justice Project, for putting on this much needed program and for also allowing my voice to be a part of it. Uh, my name is Messiah Ramkisun. I'm originally from Trinidad, West Indies. And um, I've been working with incarcerated youth for about seven years now. And it really started off via my background with the arts as a performing poet. And I had a friend who came home from doing 11 years in Maryland and he started his own organization and asked me to come on board to go in these prisons, in these jails where young people were housed. So we were going to Sheltonham Jail, DC Jail, Baltimore Juvenile Facilities, Victor Cullen Jails, and we would, we would speak and also share art with these young people. And I saw that he had a real gift, not just the gift of gab, but also using his experience to identify with them, meeting them where they were, and bringing them to a different reality. So that really inspired me to go even harder with that work, where I am currently at Rikers Island, working with 16 to 18 year olds on a daily basis with a program titled the ABLE Program to help reduce recidivism with adolescents here in New York City. So aside from that, we also do showcases in the jail. So um, one of my students who was at Rikers is currently home now, and we're working to get him to Howard University. He came out today. Asad Giles, you stand up. Right. So this is testimony when we talk about effect and change. And the, the brother said earlier, all of us got to come to the forefront. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm one player. I'm not going to get the whole C74, you know. But if I could get a few guys, you come in, you get a few guys. But this is young brother. He didn't really need the push. He already had his mind right. He knew that he wanted to affect change. He just needed the outlet. And when I work with these young people on a daily basis, that's oftentimes what you find. You know, if they have programs or they have a curfew, and they're living with a grandmother or someone and they can't get in the house because the mother is out partying or they're in unstable condition, then they're locked out and they get picked up by a cop for missing the curfew. It's not really their fault, right? So you deal with these type of conditions where resources are needed. It's not that these young people just want to be out here wilding. It's survival, right? So that's something I want us all to think about as we move forward with this work. I got my other brother who came with me today who grew up in C74, but he's now a sous chef in Japanese style cooking, right? He's a sous chef in, in, in the city, right? Doing his thing, so. But, um, and you know, it's been a blessing that the art form was able to lead me there via spoken word. So they called me today to share some poetry with you. And the poem I'm gonna do is entitled, Order of Removal, Order of Removal. Have you all been dealing with, um? Immigration detention as well? All right, because that's something that I also experienced and was able to succeed coming from Trinidad, that struggle, right? But this poem was derived from an immigration case. Whenever you have a deportation case, it's entitled Order of Removal Proceedings. Say, brothers get caught up. Brothers get caught up for the cheese like a trapped mouse. At 15, he saw his first trap house. At 16, he pulled his first strap out. No home, 
he found shelter in juvie prisons. DC jail, Rikers Island, and New Beginnings. Nubians who never knew what royalty felt like. Never wore his belt tight, so besides his pants, his gun was all he held tight. Life on hold, strong soul who became weak for his wants. I see him once a week, he been sitting for months. I go in to do my poetry workshop. The potency his words got can't be confined by all the police the world got. He told me he work out. His pops a boxer, pictures of Pacquiao on his wall. Just like him, he's powerful but small. How was a social worker supposed to nurture a child's dead spirit, early murder, court order, life a living abortion, born from holy water like the river of Jordan, now a cash cow to a prison who won't give him a portion. I tell him, hold his head. Without the army, he's a soldier. At times his arms get too heavy for his shoulder. The burden his mom's carried like a boulder. Every day he's getting older, just had a birthday. Group programs, he got an A on the survey. Never been dumb, though his literacy level is below sea level. Caught up in the beast, the D-Evil. Eyes on fire beneath the tea kettle. Now he's 18. Release date dreams, it's about time. Thought he was free till the gatekeepers gave him adult time. When will the bulb shine in this dark hour? In his bloodline is star power, no BET. A smart scholar with no GED. Intellects, young Malcolm X in the feds like FedEx mail. They shipped him to federal jail. Off to Michigan, family can't afford to visit him. Recidivism in the prison system is the heartbeat of Wall Street. Private jails create profit sales. Every time we hear the bells on the clock, black males are the stock like slaves on the dock. Now check this. Prison complexes in Texas Decrease because of less entries, more exits. The state lost money, so what's next is? Go after the Mexicans, immigrants all together. Arrested guilty and innocent all together. More cellmates to fill more bed space. If not, they lose money. More dead weight is called capitalism. That's why we face capital punishment 40 years after imprisonment. Verizon, stocks rising from collect calls, leeching the life behind these dead walls in this game of debts and debtors. Some met some mentors, men torn from the thorns of crooked judges, nickels a day for cooking lunches, hundreds of push-ups, hooks and punches, abundance of prayers and books from pundits keep his mind clear. Refueled, seeking renewal in cuffs. He's a jewel in the rough from the streets where life beyond 18 is iffy. More black men in jail than slaves in 1850. Now seriously, look in the mirror, see, and tell me that's not a conspiracy. Cocaine, the color of white supremacy, while crack rock equal black, when the latch lock is frightening. White men doing powder came home in an hour. Black man rocking the hard place, turned bass into hard rock, sitting in San Quentin and Comstock. Every night, he writes from a lonely cell like Etheridge Knight, the poet who married Sonia Sanchez before the death of his life. My brother Troy did 11. Got his life right now, he's a legend, pledging to elevate the state of his brethren. My cousin locked down right now, doing beyond 40. Talking like he'd be home shortly. That strength at its best, a weight no man can bench press. 
Not weight as in lifting bars and dumbbell, but weight as in patience living behind bars in some cell, compelled to kneel, seeking the Lord for approval. Keeping it real, he swore to be truthful. Your honor, will you appeal this order of removal? Order of removal. Thank you for listening. And one more thing. Peace. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Great job. Also, thank you to Brother Angelo for inviting me and the great work that you're doing, man. This is not the first time we've shared platforms on this type of agenda, so salute to you, man. And we need more young brothers at the forefront doing this type of work, which is why I brought some of these brothers with me today. So um, I like to network with you guys. I know a lot of you are probably doing progressive things in the community. And like I said, I'm at Rikers every day, working with these young 16 to 18 year olds. And one of the greatest challenges that I deal with is how to help connect them with resources upon coming home, right? So whatever ideas you know, that you guys may have or support systems or connections or whatever it may be, we need to connect and we need to build and we all need to be merged together. You know, we talk about a lot of times we get into this criticism about the negative things going on in society. But it seems like the positive people, seem like the positive people are very divided. You know, it's like everybody have their own movements, but we have to really know who each other are and what we're all doing in order to be able to better support our movements. All right? Um, Thank you. So yeah, my name is Messiah. You can look up my work, allmessiah.com. It's my website, A-L-L-M-E-S-S-I-A-H, allmessiah.com. Twitter, Instagram, allmessiah, to follow some of the other things that I'm doing in terms of art and activism. And also, I have some promotional stuff and CDs to give out. God bless. Peace. Thank you, Messiah. So thank you guys for being with us all day. You guys heard from Saigon earlier on the panel, and now he's going to join us for one last time. Let's clap it up for Saigon. I just want to say good, good, you know, have a great day. Sophia, I'm really here to support Sophia. She's a wonderful, wonderful individual. This lady, this lady has changed my life. She taught me things about myself. I didn't know I've been going up to the CA with a friend of mine who brought me up there and the things they do for our people and our community is amazing. So I just want to thank her and give her a big round of applause. Thank you. Well, he's not gonna get off that light. We really appreciate Saigon spending time with us and you all spending time with us, but it's through Saigon's and every single soul who's got a beating heart in their chest that we can really make a difference in the system. We can get our elders out of prison, we can get our young people out of prison, we can get everybody in between. And you know, in America, you either claim to be young or old, and nobody's claiming to be old. So we can get everybody out and do what we really need to do, which is put some real value on our most important natural resource, which is our people. So thank you for coming out. Please sign up, get involved with us. We want to see you on 125th Street and Adam Clayton Powell Boulevard in the next 20 days. Thanks for coming.